I, I did read a story this morning, talked about Klondike had operated uh, or had sold this confection for about 40 years. And a couple of years ago, discontinued it. And uh, to be honest with you, I did not know, did not realize it had been discontinued because it wouldn't have been on uh, the highest of, of items that I would have said, uh, uh, oh, give me one of those when I was making a selection. Mm -hmm. and, but apparently there was such an outcry from consumers, got to give a company credit here, that they paid attention to what their consumers were saying. And so maybe there was a little bit of uh, some, it uh, sounds like, uncivil discourse that took place there with, uh, with that, that company. And the consumers basically said, look, you need to bring this back. And interestingly enough, that's what they're uh, now attempting to do. So we'll see, we'll see where, that, uh, where that goes. All right, Choco uh, Tacos for everybody. I have a Klondike story. It's, it, I never thought this. I never saw this coming. Back in the mid '80s, I worked for a missile manufacturing company, explosive manufacturing company, Atlantic Research Corporation, and Kleber Corporation, which then I don't know if they still do, was the Klondike Bar people. They made a run to try to acquire an explosives manufacturing company, and it started kind of a, a, a bidding war in the stocks in the '80s. Nobody really saw what the common commonality between ice cream and stinger missiles was but you know it was they did not prevail well okay so so you know i that that i have to admit is uh that's that's news to me as well and i would never have made the correlation uh as to someone who's making ice cream confections why they would even want to be in you know, a defense contractor and uh, making uh, certain kinds of things. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, uh, Mr. Gilstrap, that you bring that up because that actually, something kind of related to that is there's another uh, news in the headlines. I don't know if you guys saw this this morning or not, that I think is um, it's an interesting uh, uh, piece of information that I think as um, as citizens, as taxpayers, I think there's some significance to this, which is that interest costs – on U.S. national debt for the first time this year is projected to exceed the defense spending for the U.S. Uh, military uh, in 2024 for the first time ever in history. Uh, interest expense on borrowed money the federal government has uh, currently outstanding will exceed our uh, national defense spending. That's the most frightening thing I've heard all day. Yeah, I don't disagree with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, they could have told me they were taking the Choco Taco away this morning, and I would not have been upset about that. But, yes, yeah, so much like you, Mr. Stubblefield, you know, the fact that, you know, we have borrowed to a level of, of um, just, just insanity, you know, with, with the, the, the volume of debt. And now that interest rates have, have moved up some and as some of those, uh, those, those debts mature and new ones are being issued and so forth, going out at prevailing rates – uh, we are now projected to pay more in interest on borrowed money than what we're spending on uh, U.S. national defense. The disappointing thing about that, John, is that both parties will point the finger at the other guy and say that, it's all your fault when that, both absolutely. parties contribute to it. Uh, absolutely. And there goes the civil discourse out mm. the window, right? Yeah. You know, and uh, exactly. It's, and unfortunately, sadly, it's an easy thing, you know, to point fingers. And as I, I always remind people, and, and everybody's heard this, you know, <clears throat> we don't have a, um, uh, a, a problem, if you will, with, with revenue and so forth, but we do have a problem with spending and the fact that, you know, that money gets spent these days, you know, by our federal government. You know, using dollar volumes that are staggering sums of money, and they talk about and they approve these appropriation bills and allocations of funds as if they're talking about lunch money, and uh, that's not the case at all. These are, you know, significant things, and it's it's easy to spend money when you're today that you don't have to pay for for perhaps decades down the road, and unfortunately, those are the kinds of things that. You know, on an individual basis, we would never advocate that, you know, uh, folks, you know, conduct their financial, personal financial lives in that same manner. You know, we want people to live within their means as opposed to you know, radically overspending for things that, um, you know, can, just cannot be supported John, over uh, long windows of time. John, I want to change the subject on you a little bit, but stay, yeah. stay in the large money 
uh, category. Yeah. So this is an article by Elliot Smith on the CNBC.com website today that said, in a research note Tuesday, Deutsche Bank analysts highlighted that the Magnificent Seven's combined market cap alone, and Magnificent Seven is, of course, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, which is Facebook, Microsoft, yeah. NVIDIA, and Tesla. The Magnificent Seven's combined market cap alone would make it the second largest country stock exchange in the world. Should, just on those seven. Just on those seven. Should yeah. we be concerned about that is the question they are asking. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a legitimate concern to have because think about this. Anytime you have uh, exceptionally high levels of concentration of anything into very few um, sort of that's, that's representative of the entire big picture, that always has to be a concerning thing, you know. So, and what is interesting is, you know, and make no mistake, <clears throat> those organizations are, uh, they're exceptionally large, you know, I, I, as I like to tell people, I would almost challenge them to go through a day's time without um, having some kind of contact or influence of the uh, the services of of those organizations and when you stop and you think about it you know it's probably impossible to do and so anytime you have you know that kind of uh, that volume of concentration into um so much capitalization into you know literally uh you know a handful of of corporate organizations that's a concern now what do you do about that? I don't know because you know you get all the time these <clears throat> discussions about well, you know should uh, these these firms uh, should you divest them of their interest and uh, break them up and splinter them and so forth. Uh, you guys may remember about what's it been probably 40 years ago. Uh, there was a really large um, national organization where that was done, and I'm not so sure that in in some respects. Um, you know, while it created competition on local level and so forth, you know, there were uh, there was still a lot of ripple effect created by that, uh, probably the largest divestiture of all time, that uh, there, there, there was still a lot of uh, negative and a lot of um, uh, downside that came out of that. Are you talking about AT&T? Uh, that's exactly who I'm talking about. Judge Harold Green, uh, who uh, ordered the divestiture. And here's what's interesting about that is that over time, and we still, even today, so think about this, guys, that took place, what, 40 years ago? I think it was 1983, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, and I, I'm, I'm, I may be way out in the middle of a, very, a pond with very, very thin ice underneath of me right now. But cost basis on all of those spinoff companies that took place would have been tied to, if these were non-qualified assets, would have been tied to, you know, the original cost basis in um, – you know, AT and T, and so as a result, over time, you've had all of these then, you know, mergers and acquisitions and companies. You know, the baby bells then getting together and organizing and forming, you know, uh, larger uh, companies and so forth. And you know, uh, then people get into a position where they're like, well, you know, I think I'd like to sell this position. And the question that we always ask, because we know the accountants are eventually going to ask, is, what's your cost basis? And when the answer is, well, what is that? You know, you go to explain it. And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't. I didn't keep any of that information. Well, that's problematic now. So, you know, it is interesting that you know when you get into these um, these scenarios where you do have these companies that do become uh, extremely large. Again, you always have to give consideration to. Sometimes it sounds simple. Well, let's let's take them and break them up and so forth. You know, to kind of control the amount of capitalization, the amount of influence that any one organization has, but there's always a ripple effect that you have to look at someplace else. Yeah, uh, John, it's kind of easy to get alarmed about the uh, Magnificent Seven and the control and influence they have, but we've had something similar numerous times in our history uh, when the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Gettys, the Fords, and the others. Melons. And melons, exactly. When yep. you grouped all those folks together, they probably had equal, if not more, financial control than what these Magnificent Seven did. And that's that's a, that's a, that's a true statement. That's a, that's a great point, uh, Mr. Stubblefield, because you think about, particularly, you go back to the um, you know hundred plus 
years ago, uh, the Industrial Revolution, and you know, uh, as as you know, particularly as as um, uh, America was building itself out, if you will, there were a lot of those organizations that uh, became phenomenally powerful, and you know, and and you know, there there certainly are um, you know still you know implications today of those um, you know some of those the accumulation of of business interests, wealth, and such, still you know kind of trickles its way down the day. And I've always been amused by the fact that, you know, um, there are, there are segments of our society, and this maybe gets, goes back to the, the the discussion in the last hour with regard to civil discourse, <clears throat> where people who basically then uh, look at uh, whether it's it's families or organizations or whatever that maybe got established, you know, in this case, 100, 150 years ago, you know, where um, they became very dominant, very large, uh, but at the same time, they were providing goods and services that uh, people needed at a given point in time, okay? And so, you know, I, I've always found it amusing here in the last probably, I don't know, 25, 30 years, the fact that if you were... Uh, born into a given family. Uh, today, it's almost as if you're vilified because of who your great grandfather was. Okay, and uh, but I've always looked at that as if the innovation, the invention, the goods and services that those individuals conceived of has made my life easier. I don't necessarily begrudge somebody of those kinds of situations, but make no mistake, it is one of those where they can certainly have um, a significant level of influence in terms of how um, society forms and unfolds and how things do play itself out over time. Hey, John, <clears throat> let's devise a theoretical plan here that gets me off the off the ledge a little bit. I want to go back to what we're talking about in terms of the national debt. Last week, I believe it was, maybe the week before, through bipartisan legislation, we just approved another tenth of a trillion dollars to go to Ukraine and Israel to to deal with very emergent issues. So what's what's the way to stop this? I mean, there comes a tipping point where the interest rate is just it's it's silly. It's ridiculous. So um, how what is a theoretical plan to reverse this? We still got Social Security. We still got, you know, things we have to pay Medicare. for Medicare. How 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 do we stop it? Yeah, uh, and it's it's a great question. Uh, and 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 the first comment that I'll make is this is the reason why I'm not running for uh, for the Senate or for the House of Rep U.S. House of Representatives. Okay, because to some level, you know, it's easy to say, well, we've got to curtail spending, right? Okay, okay, that's cool. What do you cut? Where do you cut? Where do you reduce? And so, you know, I think that to some to some level. You know, I think the uh, perhaps maybe the United States needs to, you know, take a look around the world. And so, for example, uh, is the U.S. right now? You speak of uh, you know uh, aid to places like Ukraine, uh, Israel, et cetera. Are other countries around the globe providing proportioned levels of support? And if the answer is, well, of course not. Well, then it comes back to why not? Why are we, as the, the U.S., you know, always that most influential? I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but back when, um, and this would have been probably in uh, 2017, 2018, somewhere through there, uh, Donald Trump, President Trump at the time, uh, appeared at a, um, I believe it was a NATO um, um, summit, and he began to call out the other countries that were NATO members with regard to the fact that they weren't fulfilling their financial obligations. And, of course, our media just exploded in terms of we can't believe he's embarrassing our allies and so forth. Well, at the time, I remember looking at it and thought to myself, well, wait a minute. I thought everybody was doing their proportioned share and responsi agreed upon responsibility anyway. Does that make sense? So for me, I would I, I think, you know, there's there's an issue as it relates to you know going back and talking to our allies and, and those other countries to make sure that we're not shouldering 
those uh, excessive and perhaps undue uh, uh, proportion to burden of the support that's being provided. That's where I would start. You know, here's the thing. If you research what the U.S. spends on foreign aid, because I, I remember doing this show 25 years ago, and it hasn't really changed. If I were to ask you, what do you think is an appropriate percentage of the U.S. budget we should spend on foreign aid? The majority of Americans surveyed overshoot the actual percentage that we allocate toward foreign aid. Now, we're in a different scenario right now with a couple of wars going on, but generally speaking, most Americans think we give about we should give about 4% of our budget. This was in a study that was done about 25 years ago. About 4% of our budget in foreign aid. In reality, in most years, we give about 1% of our budget allocated to foreign aid. The, the issue with the deficit in this country isn't how much money we're giving to Ukraine or Israel or Poland or Mexico. It's how much money we are obligated to spend on Social Security, Medicare, and national defense. The rest of the budget combined equals, Bill, you've probably done this more than I have, about 17% is discretionary yeah, that's, spending. That's close to it, yes. That's, right? That's not, our, that's not obligated to be spent, yes. Yeah, so it, it, it's that 17% where you have to try to balance the budget because you can't cut Social Security and you can't cut Medicare and you got to defend the country because we defend the world, right? Uh, yeah. So, so and, and here's the crux of the matter in terms of solving the problem. The last time we had a balanced budget was Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich exactly. as the speaker. Yeah. Yeah. If you ask Democrats, Gingrich is one of the most reviled speakers in the history of the Republican Party. If you ask Republicans, they hated Bill Clinton. But those yeah. two found a way to work together to actually give us a balanced budget during Clinton's last year in office. Now, what would happen today if a speaker worked, who was a Republican worked with the Democrats to come to some type of a deal? Well, we don't need to search too far to find that answer because we already know. He got his ass drummed out of work real quickly, right? Yeah, he, yeah. Th those, those individuals would not have won a uh, civility discourse no, award. No, right? they wouldn't have kept in their office. They wouldn't. Exactly, if, if you're exactly. a Republican now and you work with a Democrat, you don't keep your position. You can't even be photographed with a Democrat right now. It's the same on the other side. So if you wonder why young people are, are messed up, John, this is the news they get every day. Your country's going bankrupt. You got no hope. But in bed, in, uh, uh, sure. but in bed in what you're... In bed in what you were saying, Rob, is the third rail of politics that we've got to find a way to address, and that is Social Security and Medicare. We've got to find some way to address that. Until As long as we avoid it, we're going to keep this escalating national debt that we're seeing. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is, you know, you think about it, Rob, you're talking about the young people today. It's almost as if there's this vast chasm, this polarization has taken place where there really is no middle ground. There is no let's come together and let's, let's discuss this and let's find where that, uh, the commonality is and what we can agree on and, you know, where is their give and take. Anymore, it's almost as if there's, there's such polarization that exists anymore. Uh, my wife asked me not long ago, she, we were talk, watching something, or I don't remember what it was, and the question was, have things really always been this bad and I just wasn't paying attention to it? And I said, no, I think it's actually kind of uh, getting worse in terms of that that polarization and, and the chasm that exists between um, the, the two sides in terms of how we do or don't get things done today. I think part of the solution to Social Security and Medicare in particular, and perhaps to government retirement pay, I don't, but I, that's not a rail I want to touch right now. Um, we just make it very clear to people who are my son's age, hi Chris, I know you're listening, um, that you know, you know, it's not going to be 66 and two thirds for you when you can start collecting. It's going to be 72, you know, and sort of for the folks who are not yet close, say within 20 years of the goalpost right now, pick a number, um, we reset their goal. You're not going to take yeah. people who are 64 and, and move their goalposts because that's, that's just not fair. Agreed. But, but you can go way, way, way upstream well, it's what they did in 79, I think it was, or 78 when we last went through this. Right, but then they changed yeah. it by a year. No, now they, we got, it, it went from 65 to, for me, it's 67. 
Okay, so so two years. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm talking about a much larger reset than that because we're looking at workforces that they're not retiring at 65. You know, it, it's uh, they are living way past. I don't know what the the expected um, survivability rate was when uh, Social Security first came out, but I'm going to guess it was fairly close to 65. Nobody was expecting this to become, you know, an income no, for, for 20 or 30 years. The average age is like 63, I think, at that right. point. Right. So now we got average um, uh, lifespans to whatever it is, 70 and change or 75, whatever the hell it is. And going up. And, and going hopefully. up. And, going we, up. and right. we, need to, we need to reset all of that public spending to reflect that, I think. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. In fact, this is interesting. I, I will give you just real quick a uh, stat. I'd, I'd have to go get you the specific numbers. Uh, when Social Security was first in instituted and first implemented many, many decades ago, on average, the projected life expectancy under which you would collect benefits was about a year. And so today, most retirees, on average, are drawing uh, benefits between 12 to about 14 years. And the other, the other thing that does, does play into this, that stirs into this a bit, is we took what was, in effect, um, uh, an old old age and survivors program, okay, retirees, and we've stirred into that anybody who has minor children and who would pass away, we're now going to provide benefits for those minor children. In other words, instead of making sure that these folks have go acquire their own independent life insurance to provide for their family upon their demise, we just make them a, a ward of the Social Security system. And so we've added a lot of new uh, benefactors onto the system who are uh, recipients out of the program who, who, in effect, where there had been very little money put in relative to the flow of money that goes back out. So it's, it's, a, it's an entire combination of things that has created that scenario where it becomes a, uh, a challenge, no and, question. And there aren't the ratio of people paying in to the ratio of people collecting is That's much correct. smaller now. Yeah, yes. because we, we stopped well, yeah, having big boom, families. Boom. Yep, exactly. Yeah. The boomers are at the collection end as opposed to the uh, the deposit side. Correct. And that's why you need comprehensive immigration reform, John, because we've got to bring more workers into the system who are paying Social Security taxes. There you go. That's well, and that, as, see, we would view that, Rob, as that's why people need comprehensive financial planning to make sure that mm -hmm. when their Social Security benefits get altered in the future, that that's not a shock, it's not a surprise, that it's something you've actually been preparing for. Yep, I agree with you 100 percent because yeah. you, you have to take matters into your own hands in preparing for your own old age. Absolutely. Indeed. 100%. John, how do people get in touch with you for some of that financial planning? Yep. The Marriage Group is located at 1270 Winchester Avenue here in Martinsburg, West Virginia, where you can reach us at area code 304-263-4343. John, we always enjoy our discussions with you. Please say hi to Lisa for us. I sure will. Gentlemen, you guys have a good day. Thanks, John.